All right, so welcome to our first deck tech for Commander. Uh, we're going to be looking at Duretti, Scrap Savant, as our Commander. We're going to go over some of the stuff that I wanted to put into my own personal build for this deck. Uh, you're going to see that it contains a lot of the traditional stuff that you would expect to find in here, but some other cards also have my personal twist. So, first off, let's introduce him as our Commander. Duretti, he's a Planeswalker, comes into play with three loyalty counters, costs three colorless and red, uh, his plus two ability, discard up to two cards, and then draw that many cards. His minus two, sacrifice an artifact. If you do, return target artifact from your graveyard to the battlefield. And his minus ten gives you an emblem that whenever an artifact is put into your graveyard from the battlefield, return that card to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step. So, with this deck, you don't always need to have Duretti hit his ultimate and get that emblem, uh, but it does help a lot with a lot of the cards in here. So, the first thing we're going to talk about is our mana base. And then we're going to talk about our cards increasing in converted mana costs from 0 all the way up to 12. Alright, so let's take a look first at our land base. Alright, so let's get the lands out of the way. Uh, for mountains, basic mountains, I've decided to run 24 of them. Um, yeah, that's a lot for a solid color deck, but this deck is very, very important to getting 1 red mana just to be playing Duretti. Duretti is pretty much the engine of the deck, so you want to make sure that he comes into play. So having that much land is great. Uh, it's roughly one-fourth of the deck, so you should have at least one mountain in your opening hand. Let's move on to utility lands. Darksteel Citadel. Artifact land, indestructible, taps for colorless. It's a great engine for sacrificing Duretti, uh, sacrificing to Duretti, or if you have other ways that can get it into the graveyard, you can keep recurring it with the emblem. Shrine of the Forsaken Gods, taps for colorless, or you can get two mana, use it to cast colorless spells, and you can activate it if you have seven or more lands. You'll probably have seven or more lands with the amount of lands in this deck. Just another way to get more artifact stuff out into play. Scorched Ruins comes into play, sacrifice two untapped lands, or bury Scorched Ruins, taps for four colorless. This is a great way to get some acceleration and tempo. Once you drop three or four lands, all of a sudden you drop this, and you have a lot more accessible mana. Buried Ruin, taps for colorless, pay two tap sacrifice it, you get an artifact back to your hand. This is great for recurring artifacts. Phryxia's Core is an artifact sacrifice outlet. Sacrifice an artifact, you gain a life. That's fantastic. Uh, you have the emblem out, you can pay one tap, sacrifice an artifact, get it back into play the next turn, and get one life from it. Sanctum of Ugin, she taps for colorless, but whenever you cast a colorless spell with converted mana cost 7 or greater, you can sacrifice his land. If you do, you can get a colorless creature, reveal it, and put it in your hand. So you can start fetching artifact creatures that you might need later in the game if you hard cast an artifact. That costs a lot. Arcane Lighthouse uh, this is just a great way to drop hexproof on your opponent's creatures. You might not even be able to take care of the stuff, but your opponents might be able to. This is a great card to start playing politically. Springjack Pastor pays uh, four tap. Put out a 0-1 goat creature, and then you can start sacrificing goats for extra mana or extra life. This is great for also throwing out chump blockers every turn. Urza's Factory, uh, you can pay 7 and tap. I know that's a lot of mana, but in this deck you run a lot of mana, and you will actually end up using this. This also gives you a 2-2 artifact creature. Once again, sacrifice for Duretti, and you can just start using it to put out more artifact cards. Care Keep. Great card to start putting out 0-1 chump blockers, and the mana cost is a lot less. Ancient Tomb uh, taps for 2 colorless mana, and it does 2 damage to you. That's fine, but if this is the difference between getting Duretti out turn 3 and turn 4, I'm willing to take the 2 damage. This is also great for accelerating into other artifacts that produce mana. Mystifying Maze, fantastic card, 4 tap, exile target attacking creature and opponent controls, and then it gets removed, uh, put back into play afterwards. This is just a great card to prevent you from taking extra damage, especially against a commander. Reliquary Tower gives you no maximum hand size. Uh, yeah, in this deck you probably won't have a large hand, but on the occasion that you do, it's great to have this card ready. All right, We have a Great Furnace, Artifact Land taps for red, uh, just adds to the red. It's also an artifact, so you can start bouncing it and exchanging it for larger stuff from the graveyard with Duretti. And finally, I also decided to add a Forgotten Cave. Comes into play tapped and taps for red, but the cycling ability is great. If you have 
the card in your hand and you have three other lands in hand, you don't want to use it, that's great. Just cycle, cycle this and replace it with a new card. All right, so those are the lands. Next up, we're going to go through each of the cards based on their converted mana cost. All right, so the only zero drop that I put in was the Everflowing Chalice. Uh, it costs zero, has a multi-kicker of two, and it comes up with a charge counter for each time it's kicked. And it taps for one colorless mana for each charge counter on this card. It's just great turn three or four if you're looking for something else to dump out and you want to just dump all your mana into it to give yourself another mana rock. It just gives you that much more of an advantage later on. Um, you know, it's a great card. It's very versatile. Later on in the game, you can definitely pump it up to six, sometimes seven charge counters. And then you have another mana rock that's just more difficult to deal with. Alright, so now we're on to the 1-drops. Goblin Welder is an obvious choice for this. Uh, basically, red for a 1-1. One, one. Tap ability exchanges an artifact from the graveyard and in play. So with Goblin Welder, you can start exchanging some really fun stuff left and right. And you can also use it, use it on your opponent's stuff. Uh, I know it's very situational, but if you see that opportunity, you might as well take it if it works. Right, Gamble. Uh, it's the only tutor in this deck, really. Uh, it's red, search your library for a card, put it in your hand, and then discard a card at random. Usually when you play Gamble, uh, you want to play this for cards that you don't care if they get discarded, and it's usually when your hand is full of stuff that you actually want to throw in the graveyard. So Gamble becomes a nice, uh, kind of like an Entomb card, uh, if you start having less and less cards in hand. So it's a great card to run, and it's definitely worth the risk. The next card I chose to put in, uh, this is nice, especially turn one if you can play it, because... You know, your opponents get the ideal hand, maybe they mulligan down a card or two, and then you drop this thing. Burning Inquire. Each player draws three cards and then discards three cards at random. That random aspect can really mess up somebody's deck. And in this deck, with the amount of lands and the amount of artifacts that you actually want in the graveyard, you're usually going to end up quite ahead. Faithless Looting. Similar concept. Draw two cards, discard two cards, and it has a flashback cost. So it's really nice for you to start getting artifacts into the graveyard, especially to start preparing for Duretti if he uses minus ability the second you play him. Soul Ring, obvious card for this. I chose the older art as opposed to the stock commander version of it. Um, it's one mana for an artifact, taps for two colorless. Fantastic card to use in here. Pyrite Spellbomb, uh, it's nice for taking out any kind of commander that has, you know, two toughness. Uh, Takes out any kind of, you know, smaller threats. You also can sacrifice it to draw a card. It just has a lot of utility to it, and it's also a one-drop that Duretti can exchange for something larger. All right. Codex Shred uh, Shredder. I decided to put this in for a couple reasons. Uh, first off, turn one, I drop it. Next time I draw a card, I've already got one card in my graveyard. Uh, by the time I cast Duretti, you know, I'll have three, four, sometimes five cards already in the graveyard just from this thing alone. But the real power for this is let's say your Goblin Welder or something else really, really useful gets destroyed, and you don't have a means to bring it back. Well, Codex Shredder has the ability to bring any card from your graveyard to your hand. So if something gets killed, you can bring it back once you get the mana for it. Once again, the way this deck performs, 5 mana is not really that much. And finally, I also threw in the Skull Clamp. There's a lot of stuff in here, 1-1s, one uh, things that when they die they make a 1-1, one -one. when they come into play they make a 1-1, one -one. so... It's just a nice way, mid-game, to replenish your hand with 2, 4, 6, or even 8 cards if you want. Okay, moving on to the 2-drops. Uh, one of the first things that I saw from the Commander preset was the Wellspring cards. Uh, Mycosynth Wellspring basically says when it comes into play, or it gets tossed into the graveyard, you can search your library for a basic land, reveal it, and put it into your hand. So this card, when you play it, already replaces itself in your hand with a land, which, okay, not always ideal. But also when it dies, you get a land. That's two lands that you could pitch for Duretti's plus two ability to draw two new cards. And it also, uh, in the off chance, you have a bunch of colorless mana and no way to get out uh, red mana into your hand. This kind of does the job. All right, similar to the Mycosynth Wellspring, the Ichor Wellspring. Same thing, except instead of uh, giving you a land when it comes into play or is put into the graveyard, you get to draw a card from it. This card is amazing. It's another two cards that Duretti can pitch. And it's also a great card to just gain some hand advantage towards the beginning of the game. Right. I left in Magma Quake. Uh, it's an instant. Red Red does X damage to each creature without flying and each Planeswalker. It's a nice little field clearance card. But the real kicker between this is, let's say I play Duretti and use his minus two ability. Now he's got one loyalty left. 
that's kind of difficult to deal with, especially if my opponents don't want me recurring to ready for another turn. So what I can do is I can use his minus ability, then drop a Magma Quake, killing Duretti, and then when I'm ready, I can cast him later on. So it's nice to do that. It's also nice to walk out uh, to lock out all of your opponent's Planeswalkers, and it's just overall a great card for field control. With the amount of mana this deck generates, once again, it's a great piece for here. Starstorm, pretty much the same deal. Uh, I like having the instance that basically knocks out the field. It's a great way to just seriously hinder your opponent's abilities. Having the cycling ability is great if you never need to use Starstorm. Mer Sire, uh, it's just a good card. It's two mana for a 1 1. When it dies, you get another 1 1 colorless Mer. Uh, it's great for a Skull Clamp because you can clamp this, let it die, and then clamp the token, netting you four cards. Hypocrisite, uh, another great card. Good for Skull Clamp, even good for Duretti. You know, once you sacrifice it, it gets exiled with uh, suspend counters. All right, and then it comes back, it gets three plus one plus one counters on it. So that 1 1 you play on turn two all of a sudden comes back as a 4-4 four, four a few turns later. Mindstone, uh, there was a one that came with the commander deck, but I like the older look of it. I like the dark brown colored artifacts as opposed to the silver. Uh, it's just two mana, taps for a colorless, and you can pay one tap, sacrifice it to draw a card. If you get the emblem, this thing will let you draw a card pretty much every turn as long as you have the mana. Fire Diamond, enters battlefield tapped, Taps for red, just another mana rock that gets you quicker to playing Duretti. Plaguemur, I love this card. It's two mana for a 1-1 one, one Infect, and it taps for colorless. So it's a mana rock, it's a body, it's a skull clamp item, and it also poses a threat with Infect. Uh, if you let this thing go through ten times, I mean, you know, you could start using some control to lock your opponents out. This thing could start coming in and seriously messing up the game. All right, we have a Ruby Medallion. Uh, it just makes red spells cost one less to cast. So turn two, you drop your Ruby Medallion. Turn three, you have enough mana to hopefully play Duretti. You can use his minus ability to drop the Ruby Medallion and pull out something larger. All right, Thought Vessel gives you no maximum hand size, just like the Reliquary Tower, I realize. Uh, it's just another mana rock, taps for colorless. It's a great way to keep getting stuff out. And finally, this is kind of an unpopular opinion, but I love Goblin Lore. One red for a sorcery, you draw four cards, then discard three cards at random. So this gets you four cards deeper into the deck, and then throws three cards into your graveyard. The random factor, yeah, something to be afraid of at times. However, most of the time when you get stuff into your graveyard, it's pretty awesome. So you're going to benefit from that. Alright, moving on to the three drops. Crawl Space, great defensive card, no more than two tr creatures can attack you each combat. This kind of locks you into a nice little safe zone, uh, especially if you have a bunch of 1-1s or chump blockers that you can block. You can start putting things in the way and reducing the damage dealt to you. If you don't need it, just sacrifice it to Duretti a little bit later. Same thing goes with Ensnaring Bridge. Uh, I know I have a couple cards that give you no maximum hand size, but in this deck you often realize that you dump your hand as fast as you can into this to becoming as aggressive as possible. With Ensnaring Bridge, that makes the attack situation even worse. And the other idea is your opponents probably, if they're not ahead right now in terms of aggro, uh, they're going to be okay with you locking down the field until they can bring out something greater as well. Uh, the other thing about this is you can sacrifice this artifact through Duretti or some utility lands or anything else really. As long as you have the emblem, you can sacrifice Ensnaring Bridge, then you can swing because there's no rule on it, and then Ensnaring Bridge comes back at the end of the turn. So that gives you free combats and then nobody else can attack. Commander Sphere, another nice little mana rock, uh, three mana, you're always going to tap for red. Uh, I know it doesn't give you the most efficiency back, but the ability to sacrifice it and draw a card is fantastic. If you get the emblem, it's even better, because then you can sacrifice it every turn and have it return back to the end step. So if in, you have four players or five players, you can draw four to five cards every turn if you need. Worn Power Stone, three mana, comes to play tapped, taps for two colorless. Once again, just another mana rock that quickly accelerates you where you need to go, and it's also more sacrifice fodder if you have too much available mana. Palladium Mirror. Another card. Three, three, uh, three mana for a 2-2. Two, two. Taps for two colorless. The mana acceleration in this deck is uh, very, very aggressive. So having a creature out that gives you additional mana can't hurt to have. Uh, also, you can Skull Clamp it and then sacrifice it to Duretti or another sacrifice outlet, 
and you can draw some cards from its death. Unstable Obelisk, 3 mana, taps for colorless. The real power in this is 7 tap sacrifice that destroy target permanent. If you have this in play, and the emblem, you can start popping things almost every turn as long as you can figure out ways to generate enough mana. All right, I put in a Blood Moon. Um, I like shutting down fetch lands. Uh, I really like shutting down pretty much anything that my opponents have at their arsenal. So having a Blood Moon out means that all their non-basic lands now mountains. So there's a heavy meta on this. Uh, Blood Moon seriously locks down the game at times. Wheel of Fortune, an obvious card to play. This deck exhausts its hand, so what you can do is wait till you have no cards in hand, your opponents have five or six cards, or you know somebody started to build up a combo, and then drop the Wheel of Fortune. If you have some artifacts in your hand and you happen to accidentally throw them in, uh, it's even better, because then you have some more stuff for Duretti to fish out. Scarecrow, obvious choice for this deck. Three mana for a 1-2. You can pay one, sacrifice a Scarecrow. This is the only Scarecrow in the deck, so it only works for itself. You can draw a card. Uh, but the real kicker is the 4-tap, return an artifact creature card from your graveyard to play. This reanimates some seriously powerful stuff. So you might as well use it every turn. Uh, the other cool thing about it is if you have the emblem out, you can pay one, sacrifice this, draw a card, it comes back into play at the end of the turn. So every player's turn, you can draw an extra card. Junk Diver, uh, just a nice little chump blocker, and you're hoping that it will die, because then you can bring another graveyard uh, card from your graveyard back to your hand. So you can start looping this, where you start pulling back stuff that has more utility, or something small that got knocked out earlier, or something that could even drastically change the game. Pilgrim's Eye, 3 mana for a 1-1 one -one flyer, so it's a great blocker. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, it can search your library for a basic land, reveal it, put it in your hand, and shuffle your library. Once again, it just puts more cards into your hand for Duretti, it also gives you mana acceleration. It's just a great card for this deck. All right, moving on to the four drops. Uh, Silent Arbiter, four mana for a 1-5, only lets one creature attack, and only lets one creature block on each combat. Great card to start uh, seriously locking down the field. It's also a 1-5 body, so if you drop this turn four, your opponent's got to match his toughness if they want to start opening up the field for more attacks. Alright, uh, Neveneral's Disc, an obvious card for this deck, comes into play tapped, pay one tap, destroy all artifacts, creatures, and enchantments. There's a couple cards in here that makes everything that you control indestructible, or at least all of your uh, artifacts. So, with Neveneral's Disc, it doesn't have any say anything about sacrificing it. So you can pay one tap, destroy everything, next turn you can pay one tap, destroy everything, one tap, destroy everything, again and again and again. So you can keep the whole field on lockdown if you really need it. Thran Dynamo, uh, a more aggressive mana rock, costs 4 mana. You can get this out sometimes turn 3, but the cool thing is, if you have the 4 mana, play it, play this out, tap for 3 colorless, throw out another artifact as well. Solemn Simulacrum, uh, same thing, you know, it's a great card. It has an enters the battlefield effect, and it has a leaves the battlefield effect. Comes into play, you may search for that mountain you need, or just to throw another mountain onto the field. When it dies, you get to draw a card. So not only does the sacrifice effect on this for Duretti give you an extra card, but it also gives you the reanimation that you wanted as well. Trading Post. Uh, it's four mana. It has four different things. They're all amazing. Uh, you can gain some life. You can pay life to get a 0-1 chump blocker. You can sacrifice a creature to get an artifact to your hand. And you can even sacrifice an artifact to draw a card. Even looking at Solemn Simulacrum, the card we just looked at. Another fantastic thing for this artifact. Unwinding Clock. That's four mana. You untap all artifacts you control during each other player's untap step. This gets you way, way, way out there when uh, it comes down to control, having available mana, using activated abilities of the stuff you have, uh, even when the emblem starts coming into play, you know, the unstable obelisk. If you're untapping seven mana worth of artifacts, you can pop it every turn and destroy a permanent every turn. So definitely a way to keep all of your opponents at bay. And one of the newer cards that I decided to toss in, Aligned Hedron Network. Four mana for an artifact, it exiles all creatures with power five or greater until this card leaves the battlefield. Uh, I played against Omnath, Locus of Rage, recently, and having this guy out is great because it exiles the tokens, they never come back, and they don't have any leaves the, uh, or hits the graveyard doing extra damage. So it's a great way to exile stuff without destroying it, a lot of cards have, you know, when, they just, when they're destroyed, when they die, anything else like that. This uh, gives you a much better approach toward locking out the game.
And cool thing is you can even lock out your own stuff and then bring it back later when you do a Duretti swap from your graveyard. All right, five drops. So the first card we're looking at is Memory Jar. Five mana, you can tap, sacrifice it. Each player sets aside their hand face down. They get seven new cards. At the end of the turn, they discard those cards and then they return the original exiled cards back to their hand. Memory Jar is great. I usually don't even use it to play something. I will uh, tap, sacrifice it, get my new hand of seven, use Duretti's ability to discard two and then draw two, maybe play something that's useful to me, and then let the turn end, because then I'm just going to discard my entire hand to the graveyard. More stuff in there means more options that I have to pull out. Alamaret's Archive. Uh, this card is specifically just for Duretti's plus two ability. Uh, the drawing a card except for the first one gives you two cards instead. So if you have this out and you use Duretti's ability to discard two, you get to draw four cards. Uh, Skull Clamp now gives you four cards, and there's a couple other cards that let you draw additional cards as well. This is just a great way to turbocharge your hand. Uh, yeah, the trading post will give you eight life instead of four, which, to be honest, that's a pretty significant number. Uh, but, you know, the point of this card really is to give you the extra draws. And then when you're finished with it, just sacrifice it to Duretti to bring out something more intimidating. Alright, Cool Dotha Forge Master, another obvious choice for this deck. 5 mana for a 3-5, you can tap, sacrifice 3 artifacts, by the way one of them can be itself. You can search your library for any artifact, put it into the battlefield. You'll see some of the later drops and see why I wanted to put this into the deck. Alright, Mirror Works, uh, whenever a non-token artifact comes into play, you can pay 2 mana and you get a copy of it. So now you can start copying things that come into play with Duretti. Then if you really want, sacrifice the copy clone to bring something else back into play. Or use Goblin Welder or any other tricks you want to use to get copies of items. Right. And finally, the last 5 drop, of course, is going to be Scrap Mastery. 3 red red sorcery. Each player exiles all artifacts from their graveyard, then sacrifice all their artifacts. Then all the cards that were exiled get put back into play. If you keep getting shut down and they don't let Duretti into play, just keep using his discard ability again and again, and then drop this thing. If you have five or six huge artifacts that do some crazy stuff, you can pop them all into fr into play. Turn four, five, six, I don't know. Whatever turn you're ready to start playing. Scrap Mastery is a must-have in this deck. Alright, so moving on to the six drops. Soul of New Phyrexia, artifact creature. Six, six with trample. You can pay five to give all your permanents indestructible until end of turn. Great way to save you against stuff. And even if Soul of New Phyrexia is in your graveyard you still have that ability as long as you exile him from it. Great card to run in, uh, great card to just be an emergency backup for stuff. And the best part is when people forget that he's in your graveyard, all of a sudden, you can use his exile ability and catch him by surprise. So something like massive land destruction, or even the Shatterstorm, you know, destroy all artifacts, destroy all creatures, whatever gets destroyed, you can counter that as a last resort. Steel Hellkite, another obvious choice. Six mana for a 5 5 flyer. You can pay two to give him plus one plus zero till end of turn, so you can even beef him up with all that extra mana you're generating. But his real power comes down to destroying permanents with converted mana cost X, whose controller was dealt combat damage. So you play this, and all of a sudden you hit really, really hard. And on top of that, you can start destroying anything of their choice. And it's anything artifacts, creatures, enchantments, planeswalkers. Anything that you want can get knocked out by Steel Hellkite as long as you have the mana. And trust me, in this deck, you almost always have the mana. Mindslaver, another great choice. I mean, it's six mana. You can pay four tap, sacrifice it to gain control of target player's next turn. If you have the emblem out, this thing gets bonkers. If you have an unwinding clock and you start having some uh, mana generators, you could take control of every single person's turn. So Mindslaver, a must-have for this deck. Worm Coil Engine, a card that is both extremely intimidating, uh, but it's also more intimidating when it dies because it breaks into two pieces. So it's a 6-6 Death Touch lifelink. When it dies, you get a 3-3 Worm that has Death Touch and a 3-3 Worm that has lifelink. If you use Goblin Welder to sacrifice it, throw it into the graveyard, you can use Duretti's ability to sacrifice one of the Worm tokens to bring it back into play. And you can keep doing this again and again and again and keep increasing your arsenal of lifelinks or Death Touches or pretty much however you want to approach it. Alright, Incite Rebellion is a card that uh, 
I was kind of iffy about, but I saw it perform a couple times against a few decks, and I realized that it's another great field clearance card. For each player, it deals damage to that player and each creature they control, equal to the number of creatures they control. So if you got 10 creatures, everything on your side, including you, is taking 10 damage. So this is a nice way to uh, kind of even the odds if your opponents are outpacing you. You know, they got five or six creatures. Anything tribal, this will take care of most of that. So Incite Rebellion is a really, really fun card to use. You can also hit your opponent for quite a bit of damage. You know, they may have six or seven life left, and if they have an army, you can just knock them out of the game right there. Right. And also Eternity Vessel. With the number of lands in this deck, you need Eternity Vessel. Uh, you know, it comes into play with X Charge Counter, where it's your life total, so you could cheat this out at 40 life, and as long as you dedicate yourself to keeping it protected, you're probably going to draw a land every three or four cards. So Eternity Vessel fantastic card to put in, especially because it keeps resetting your life. Uh, some other ideas, if you have a Goblin Welder out and you have an artifact land in your graveyard, you can do the swap instantaneously to gain that life. So uh, you don't have to worry about sorcery speed, lands, resetting your life total. Okay, so the last thing we're going to look at, uh, we're going to do 7, 8, 9, and even anything else that adds any more. There's no point in doing a little segment that's based off one or two cards. All right, so seven drops. Myrrh Battlesphere. Uh, it's just a great card. When it comes into play, you get four 1-1 one, one colorless Myrrh. So the Kodotha Forge Master that taps to sacrifice three artifacts. Well, you can use those three artifacts generated from Myrrh Battlesphere. Uh, they're great to Skull Clamp to draw extra cards. It's also got a great ability when you start attacking with it. You can tap any number of Myrrh and give it plus X plus O. So with the four more that come with it, it already becomes an 8-7, and it does four damage to the defending player. There's also a couple other Murr in this deck, and also if you can keep recurring Murr Battlesphere out again and again and again, well, Murr Battlesphere is going to become a very, very intimidating creature. And if they kill it, you will probably just bring it back and get more Murr. All this dust is a great field clearance for this deck. Uh, I mean, pretty much there's like one or two red permanents in this deck. So, really, uh, All is Dust is a one-sided Wrath, or actually a one-sided Akroma's Vengeance. But, even though things are indestructible, they have to be sacrificed. So, All is Dust is a fantastic card that pulls some really, really powerful stuff uh, out of the way. Spine of Ish Sa, uh, 7 mana, comes to play Destroy a Permanent, so you can keep cheating it out with Duretti. The interesting thing about this is when it's put into the graveyard, you return it back to your hand. So that's discard fodder to for to ready for the next turn. Um, also, if you have the mana, you can play it, sacrifice it. If you have the mana, you can even play it again. So this is just a great way for taking care of some pesky permanents. And it's colorless, so anything that has protection, well, it's not going to work as well as we had hoped. All right. Pentavis, 7 mana, comes to play with 5 plus 1 plus 1 counters on it. You can start removing stuff to put out artifact creatures. And you can sacrifice them to put stuff back onto here. So with Pentavis, it's great. Um, if you have the emblem, you can just exhaust all five counters from it. It dies, end step comes back into play. So you have a very, very large Pentavite token generator. You can Skull Clamp them. You can use them for Duretti's Sacrifice. You can use them for Goblin Welder. You can use them for Koldotha Forge Master. There's so many different uses for this. Very similar to the Mer Battle Sphere. Alright, Platinum Angel, another no-brainer in this deck. Uh, you can't lose and your opponents can't win, so you cheat this guy out, and all of a sudden you are safe as long as Platinum Angel remains in play. Uh, it's a really, really fun card to use. It's a great way to pull it out with Koldotha Forge Master as a response or last-minute effect to you losing the game. You pop this out, all of a sudden you can't die. So, it's a really great card. It's also a 4-4 beater that goes through the air. Right, on the 8 drops, we have Bosch Iron Golem, 8 mana, 6, 7 Trample. You can pay 3 in red, sacrifice an artifact, and do damage equal to the sacrifice artifact's converted mana cost to a target. Combine this with stuff like Spine of Ish Sa and the Emblem, you can start popping stuff and doing some serious damage, and when Spine comes back into play, you can start destroying permanents. You can also sacrifice Bosch himself, and he can start doing damage as well. I tossed in an Ugin. Uh, you have the mana to play him most of the time. Uh, this plus two is just a lightning bolt where you can hit wherever you want, so that's great. Planeswalkers, creatures, anything that's in the way. You could even hit your own stuff if you really wanted to on the emblem. Uh, but his real ability that I like to use is his minus X. Each, uh, exile each permanent with converted mana cost X or less that's one or more colors. 
Like I said, there's only two red permanents in this deck. So this is just a great card to toss in. And his ultimate, I mean, it's even better. Uh, you gain seven life, draw seven cards, put seven permanents from your hand onto the battlefield. So you can start putting your artifacts from your library into play as well, if you wanted to make it a little bit more uh, intimidating. Darksteel Forge, nine mana for an artifact. Uh, I've hardcasted this actually more times than I've cheated it into play. It gives your artifacts indestructible. It's a great way to really wrap up the game and then just start tossing in some crazy powerful beats. And hey, look at that, all your stuff is indestructible. Put in a Blasphemous Act. Uh, in multiplayer, this card is amazing because most of the time it just costs red and it's a 13 damage field clearance. So it's a really fun card to uh, you know keep throwing around. All right, and finally, the last card I put in was a Blightsteel Colossus. Although he can't hit the uh, graveyard, there are some silver linings to that. First off, I know you can't cheat him into play, but let's say you are going through your library incredibly fast, you get locked into a stalemate, and your opponent starts switching to a milling strategy, or you just see the cards are starting to disappear. You can put Blightsteel Colossus in and use him as a discard option every single time. So... It's just a great way to keep one card in your library if you want to try to outpace your opponent. You can cheat him into play with stuff, and some of the times you even have the enough mana to hard cast him. Alright, so, Blightsteel Colossus, he's a nice final finishing touch. Uh, yeah, so, that's pretty much it. That's the Duretti Commander deck that I built. I know I'm heavy on lands, but, uh, you know, in my experience, having the extra lands is just extra stuff that Duretti can keep dropping. Uh, having the open mana, having the mana rocks, having the sacrifice engine, having the recursion engine. All of it fits together very nice and well. And while I realize there are some other upgrades that this deck can use, uh, I'm trying to build this on a semi-moderate budget. Uh, you know, I could start looking for stuff like Mana Crypt and, you know, some other artifacts that are extremely expensive. However, when it comes to this deck, uh, pretty much seems to hold its own. It's played against about 15 or 16 different commander decks, and a lot of the times it comes out ahead or puts up a really good fight. Alright, so, I know this is from the Commander 2014 set. Uh, I'll try to link a link to Amazon. They might have an inflated price because of the scarcity of them. But if you're looking for a great Commander to get into, you got some artifacts lying around, uh, you like red, you like being a jerk, you like throwing stuff out from your hand, you like seeing all these crazy artifact interactions, you know, Duretti is the Commander for you. Alright, so, if you have any questions, be sure to add them in the comments. Uh, like, subscribe, and share this video if you thought it was good. Alright, thanks for watching.